Hello, I'm Joyce Jacobson. I'm president at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, and I've also been teaching economics for over 30 years. I taught at Rhodes College, and then I taught at Wesleyan University, and now I'm at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And throughout my career, one of my favorite topics both to do research on and teach about has been labor economics. And I hope in this lecture today, I can give you an idea of some of the reasons why labor economics is such an interesting part of the total area of economics. Labor economics has many topics. I'll take up three areas today, which are very central to the field. One is wage determination in competitive labor markets. Now in unit five, you've already been covering factor markets. And in my view, again, the most interesting factor market is labor because it's about people. So we'll look at the base model of competitive labor markets. We'll look at why both we see differences in wages across different labor markets and also across different individuals. And we'll talk about wage determination in non-competitive labor markets, looking at two cases. One is the case where there is only one seller of labor, in other words, a labor union, and the case where there is only one buyer of labor, a monopsony or a single employer in a labor market. So now to look at wage determination in competitive labor markets, the first thing we think about is what affects the demand for labor? Well, demand for labor comes from firms because they're producing products that they are then selling in product markets. So firms have demand for labor, which is what we call a derived demand. They only want labor because it's useful in another production process. Then the total demand in a labor market is the sum of all the individual firm demands. So in each case, a firm demand, firm demand is a downward sloping demand curve, and then we sum those up to get total labor market demand. On the other side of the market, what affects the supply of labor? Individuals determine how much labor to supply to the labor market. And then again, we sum up to get the total supply of labor by adding up the individual labor supply curves. So at each point, a supply curve is showing both the price that we're trading at and the quantity that is being supplied. We add those things together in the sense of looking for the intersection of market supply and demand, and that determines the wage we observe in a labor market as well as the level of employment. A simple graph shows this. Here I'm labeling it as a weekly wage, and I'm labeling the quantity of labor as the number of workers. There's a downward sloping demand curve in this market. There's an upward sloping supply curve. It actually gets fairly vertical at some point as we basically run out of workers in the market potentially. And then we see that the intersection of supply and demand determines a weekly wage of $500 in this market and a number of workers of 100,000. Let's look at some actual data taken from the Federal Reserve Board. Here's data that shows from 1950 up to the beginning of 2020, what's actually happened on the one hand with, not, with real compensation per hour, which is a measure of a wage, and what's happened to the average annual hours worked by persons. What's interesting to note is basically we've been seeing rising compensation in real terms over this entire period with a lot of variation, some slowdown later on in the period, and we see a long secular drop in the average annual hours worked, which used to be well over 2,000 hours per year and is now down around 1,760 hours per year. In recessions, in the banded lines, we see in general that works drops, but the longer term aspect is the more interesting one, which is that people are basically working fewer hours per year now if they're in the labor market than they did over 70 years ago. What causes firm labor demand? Well, one thing you've already probably learned in Unit 5 is about the principle of marginal productivity. A firm hires labor to use in production. As I said, it's a derived demand for labor and then they decide to continue to hire labor based on what the marginal revenue product is of labor. Marginal revenue product of labor is equal to the marginal revenue times the marginal product of labor. In other words, how much additional revenue am I gathering per unit sold in the product market times the number of units that the marginal worker can create. In a competitive labor market, marginal revenue equals price, but the more general statement which allows for non-competitive product markets is to say marginal revenue. 
the firm hires units of labor up to where the last unit hired exactly covers the wage or the price of labor. In other words, up to where the marginal revenue product of labor equals the price of labor. And that's a general rule for factor markets. The firm's demand curve for labor is the downward sloping part of its marginal revenue product curve. It doesn't stop until it gets the downward sloping part because if there's upward sloping parts, then they're getting more product per person and want to continue until it starts to come down again. Firm labor demand then also can shift over time. And the question is what kinds of things shift the marginal revenue product for labor curve and thus the demand curve for labor? One thing is changes in the product market. So if the price and the marginal revenue rise or fall in the product market, then this will cause shifts. If marginal revenue rises, it's going to increase the demand for labor. If marginal revenue falls, it's going to decrease the demand for labor. Changes in the marginal product of labor, or what we would call productivity of labor, also shift the curve. Increases in the marginal product of labor will increase the firm's demand for labor. Decreases in the marginal product of labor will decrease it. So again, increased demand in product markets makes marginal revenue rise. Increased human capital, the ability of individuals to be more productive will make the marginal product of labor rise. So we will see things that create human capital, such as education and experience and work, make efficiency and therefore productivity rise. Technological change can also make marginal product of labor rise. As we come up with more efficient ways to do things, that will tend to increase the productivity of labor and shift the labor demand curve to the right. But on the flip side, technological change will also make prices and marginal revenue fall in product markets. So technological change shifts supply curves down in product markets. And so there's actually an ambiguous net effect of technological change on the marginal revenue product of labor and thus on firm labor demand. This is one of the more interesting topics in labor economics because it asks, as we have increased technological change over time, will we see a decrease in the overall demand for labor? So far, labor has moved out of certain industries that don't need it as much into others, but will those trends follow over time or will at some point we actually need less total labor? This is a really important question for societies. On the flip side of the market, let's look at labor supply. So supply is coming from individuals. A person decides whether or not to work and how much to work in the trade-off of marginal utility that they get from leisure time versus marginal utility from consumption, where consumption is purchased with the earnings. So again, it's a derived demand. They don't want to work directly normally, but that the idea is that you work so that you can make earnings and then buy consumption. So wage increases will therefore have an ambiguous net effect on time spent working. On the one hand, there's the substitution effect, which is as wages rise, the opportunity cost of leisure rises or the price, so you buy less leisure or in other words, work more. On the flip side, if wages rise for any amount of work you put forth, you now are wealthier. So you can also choose to buy more leisure or work less. So we would expect these two to balance off. Now, this also assumes that leisure is a normal good and you actually want more of it as you become wealthier. Um, and that may not be true for everybody. Perhaps people actually enjoy working or they change their mind about work uh, depending on their income level and not work less. So in any case, we can imagine a possible labor supply curve for an individual as having three segments. In the lower part, as wages are low and then start rising, we would generally think that the substitution effect would outweigh the income effect and we would have an upward sloping supply curve for labor. In a middle range, the income effect could exactly offset the substitution effect and we would see an inelastic supply of labor in that range. And finally, if the wage rises high enough, people will in general work less and as income effects outweigh substitution effects and you will get a backward bending labor supply curve in these upper ranges. Again, for the whole economy, we generally expect the overall labor supply curve to continue to be upward sloping or at worst vertical because additional people will also enter into the market as the wage rises. Now, the second topic I wanted to talk about today is market wage differentials and also individual wage differentials. Market wage differentials can come up when you see over different labor markets, different actual wages. And notice that in a perfectly uh, mobile world where firms and or workers can move freely between labor markets, then we would see the same wage for all types of labor. 
doctors would make the same as lawyers, would make the same as nurses, would make the same as counter workers at a fast food restaurant. But in fact, we don't see that. And so one of the most interesting questions in labor economics is, why do we see differences across different types of labor markets? Well, on the one hand, they have different supply and demand curves. And why do we see that? Well, for instance, occupations. There are different occupations and different numbers of people who want to be, say, doctors versus lawyers versus um, teachers. Um, there are also different industrial labor markets. Some people work in the auto industry. Some people work in education. Some people work in the film industry. And we see differences by location. Some people work in the United States. Some people work in China. And there is imperfect mobility in many cases between these different markets. If you are trained to be a teacher, it might be very difficult for you to become a physician instead. If you live in America, it might be difficult for you to move to China. And therefore, since there's imperfect mobility of both firms and workers between these labor markets, we will see differences in the price in these markets, as well as the number of people working in them. So again, markets do not all end up at the same wage, and it's interesting to think about why that happens. Consider two markets. In market one, we have a particular supply and demand curve. In market two, we see that the demand is lower at any given wage, and also imagine that the supply is higher at any given wage. Those two forces together mean that compared to the wage in market A at W1, that the wage in market two, W2, will be lower. So both lower demand and or higher supply into a market tend to push wages lower. And again, if people can't move freely between markets and firms can't substitute types of labor, these differentials can last for very long periods of time. This is true also for individuals. So individuals make different wages. And why is that? Well, it seems that different people can have different productivity levels. So again, thinking about the marginal product of labor, they as individuals can also have different marginal products. This could be because people have different amounts of human capital, of which the most common kind that we think of is education. Some people have high school degrees, some people have college degrees, some people have professional degrees. People with more education on average will make more money. And the idea is that they are more productive and that is reflecting that. Um, people also have different amounts of different abilities. I am pretty good at teaching economics, but I am not so good at basketball, not being very tall for one thing. Um, a great player like, say, a LeBron James has a lot of basketball ability. Basketball is a highly valued skill, so LeBron James is going to make a lot more money being a basket player in the NBA than I am going to make being an economics professor at my college. Um, people can also expand different amounts of effort. Imagine that you were being paid on a piecework mate, for instance, and then people who put in more effort in a given period of time would produce more output and then also potentially then get more pay. So there are different amounts of human capital, abilities, and effort. Different people also have different tastes. Um, people may have different preferences for working conditions. If very few people want to take a risky job and many people want a safe job, we may see that those people in the risky job will actually get paid more to induce people to actually take on that risk. Another thing is that people have different preferences for work versus leisure. So people are willing to work different amounts and invest different amounts in the human capital related to work. Now, there are dissenting views on why we see wage differentials, some interesting counter theories. And again, why labor economics is so interesting is because there is dissent. There's not complete agreement about what's going on. One thing is whether education is really about screening people based on ability versus actually giving them skills. So if you get into a fancy college like Harvard University, is that subsequent amount that you make related to what you learned at Harvard? Or is it based on the fact that Harvard let you in in the first place based Based on your ability measured by things like test scores and grades in high school. It's an interesting question about what we actually learn in school. Secondly, a theory of double labor markets say that people can end up in dead ends if they start there. So even if you had two people that were identical and one person starts in say an internship in a um, bank and the other person starts working uh, at a fast food restaurant, maybe it will be very hard for the person to move out of the fast food job into the banking job. And therefore you can end up in a situation of, of reduced mobility even when people were identical to begin with. A third possibility 
is that there's discrimination, that people based particularly on their demographic characteristics like gender, race, ethnicity, age, et cetera, do not have equal access to all labor markets. And therefore, when we see wage differentials, this can reflect discrimination occurring in our society. These are all very interesting theories. And again, it's about people. So wondering what is the right theory and how to figure out where we can see which one is right is one of the interesting questions we work on in labor economics. Let me show you some actual data again, again, using the Federal Reserve database. Here are data since the uh, middle 1970s up to the present on looking at for full-time workers, what the weekly earnings are, nominal earnings for four groups, white men, black or African-American men, white women, and black or African-American women. Now over this entire period, the top line is um, the line for white men. And what we see is over this entire period, white men make more than the other three groups. Interestingly, for white women versus black or African-American men, in the beginning of this period in the late 1970s, men were making more than women. But then we see there's actually a turnover period between 1990 and 2000. And after 2000, white women actually make more than black men. Meanwhile, black women make less over this entire period. So why do we see these differences in earnings? Is it related to discrimination, possibly by both gender and race? Is it related to differences in human capital? What is causing these differentials and why do we see these changes and patterns over time? These are the kind of interesting questions that we take of a labor economics and look at data to get an idea of what's actually going on in our society. Okay, third topic I wanted to cover today, it's wage determination and non-competitive labor markets. Here again, we've talked about two kinds. One is that there could be unions. A labor union can act as a monopolist in labor markets and serve as the sole supplier of labor if workers band together to act as one in negotiating with employers. This will in general lead to a higher price for labor or a higher wage and lower quantity because then labor demand will be lower at that higher wage. So unions actually face trade-offs in terms of increasing their membership versus increasing their wages for their members. And a very interesting topic in labor and access, what's been going on with unions over the past 100 years, for instance. Um, another topic of interest then is what if you have a single buyer of labor in the labor market? What if you have a monopsony? And so in this case, a classic example would be something like a coal mine in a small town where they are literally the only employer and people stay there because they want to be there for other reasons like family. Now the result is the opposite in terms of price. We now get a lower wage because the power lies on the side of the buyer. And again, we get lower quantity as well because the buyer also knows that if they want to have more people work, they have to raise the wage. If I compare these two diagrams, and I know you're familiar from earlier units, probably with monopoly and possibly with monopsony, we see again that we can compare these two cases to the competitive case. In the competitive case, marked by the P sub C and Q sub C in both diagrams, we have it where basically supply in the competitive case equals demand in the competitive case. In the monopoly case, we end up with a lower price, a lower quantity and a higher price, marked as PM and QM. In monopsony, we end up with a lower price and a lower quantity is again marked by PMQM. So both of these cause deadweight loss in the market and cause reduced trading of labor relative to the competitive case. The final thing you might have been wondering about here is what happens if you have bilateral monopoly or countervailing power, a monopolist or a union facing a monopsonist. Does that give us a competitive outcome? And the answer is not necessarily, because now you're really more in a world of negotiation. In a world of negotiation, it's hard to predict what will happen. Countervailing power does not necessarily lead to the competitive outcome because it's a negotiation. And we also don't know exactly what the price will be. It's going to be in the range between what the monopolist would like to pay and what the monopsonist would like to have paid but it doesn't necessarily end up at either of those extremes or at the competitive one. So another really interesting thing about labor economics, again, because it's about people, is often you actually don't know what's going to happen exactly because it depends on negotiation. So that's just an example of some of the topics that I think are interesting in labor economics as you close out unit five in your study of it. I hope you'll take the time to study more labor economics as you go forward in your career and hopefully study economics in general as well too, because. I think it's one of the greatest and most interesting fields of study. Thank you so much for listening to me today.